I'm so happy to have each and every one of you as we come back to the book of Jeremiah. Now, last week we studied um, chapter 36 and 37, and it was about, um, it, we, we were back to King Jehoiakim, who was a very wicked king, and how they had found the, uh, the scrolls. And after hearing it, the princess said they had to show the king. And if you remember right, they hid the scroll and just went in and kind of told him by word of mouth, uh, more or less, what it was all about. And he demanded to see the scroll. And he took that scroll and cut it up in pieces and uh, burned it. Every couple of pages, cut them up and burn it. And then after that was finished, before they had gone to see the king, they had told Baruch and uh, Jeremiah, you better hide yourself because he had already killed uh, Elijah, the prophet. In fact, went into the neighboring country where he had fled and, and had him brought back and then killed him. So he was capable of the worst things. And he told the men, he said, go bring Baruch and Jeremiah, if you remember the story. And the Bible says in chapter 36, but the Lord hid them. The Lord hid them. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes you wonder these marvelous things take place in the Bible. Do they still take place today? Now, last week, right after teaching you, then I heard an up-to-date story about the Lord hid them. And I... I said, whoa, I wish I would have heard that, you know, uh, earlier, I would have told the story. And uh, anyways, uh, I received permission to tell the story. So I'm going to start our class off. You know, it wasn't easy in the days of Jeremiah to be prophet of the Lord. There were prophets and then there were prophets. There were false prophets, you know, they uh, just tickled the people's ears, said the things that they wanted to hear. And then there were the true prophets of the Lord that was God's mouthpiece. And it was God telling them what to say. And, you know, it wasn't always good because if people wanted to go their own way, do their own thing, commit sin and rebel against God in their daily living, then what the Lord had to tell them was not, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. And that's all people wanted to hear. Do my own thing and hear God say, I love you. But I want you to know, friends, it isn't that way at all. All right. Uh, if we want the blessing of God, then we must choose the ways of God. And if we want our own way, then we cannot expect good words from the Lord because the Bible tells us very clearly, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New, that if you go your own way, you'll be cursed rather than blessed. So I'm going to start this class out with this true to life story so that we will know God is still the same God. He can do the things that he told about in God's word. Uh, it isn't something unique for the Old Testament. No, he can do it in the new as well. And then after the story, as I said, it wasn't easy to be uh, a true prophet of God because the message they had uh, and Jeremiah was definitely a true uh, prophet. It was God's own word, and it was words of 
judgment and words that he was going to have to punish them. And it would be via the uh, king of ba Babylon. All right, let's go now to this story that I want to tell you about. It, this took place quite a few years ago, many years ago. And uh, it was in the land of China. All right. Um, a part of China that was um, under a lot of, you know, surveillance and uh, things like that. They, they were very careful about who came and who went and uh, so forth. So there were these four people, all right? One was a local and one, three of them were uh, European, all right? Two ladies and two men. The two ladies were together and the two, they were all in one group, but they um, went together as two ladies and two men and with the men, were like three animals, I believe one horse and two mules. And then some of the things that they were carrying on those animals were, you know, the, the good news of Jesus, tracts and Bibles and things like that. Well, the two girls were ahead and um, suddenly they saw beyond them that they were coming to this place it was uh like soldiers there and they were going to they were gonna they were examining people that went through both people and animals they were checking them out and seeing what they had on them and you know finding out why they were coming this way because it was quite a an area of china that not everybody was allowed to be there. So just, you know, when they saw that, they were, oh, wow, what are we going to do? And then suddenly in front of them, they saw a road that turned off to the left, like a pathway. And so they quickly turned down that road and that road would skirt around and come out on the other side of the uh, the, the soldiers, they tried to get the attention of the two men behind, but they couldn't. Uh, they were too far back to do it. So they turned themselves and they thought, well, we saw this road. They'll also see the road. Anyways, they went on this pathway and got to this. It was kind of like going up a mountain and they were like they got behind this huge boulder or a, a huge stone, huge stone. And as they were hiding behind that, they could look down and see the soldiers and see everything that went on. And then suddenly they saw the two men and the three animals with all of the stuff on it. It would have been a fiasco if they were stopped and oh my God, goodness they never saw the road that we took and they just went straight ahead and were coming toward the soldiers so they the, these two ladies were praying to god oh you know help us lord help them lord don't let them get caught because uh we we want to distribute your word uh, in an area that has never had your word and Oh, God, undertake. Well, you know, the two men and the three animals just marched right through. That nobody stopped them. That they were stopping everybody else. And they were, uh, you know, inspecting even the animals. And yet they never stopped them. So they, when they saw that, then they kept, kept going and their road finally came back down on this road and uh, they waited there for these two men to come. And when they came, they said, wow, how did you get through the 
the soldiers. They said, what soldiers? They never saw any soldiers. So they just marched on. And definitely from the sound of it all, the soldiers definitely didn't see them. So God blinded the eyes of both sides so that there was no fear on the two men's side and blinded the eyes of the soldiers. So they just marched through safely. They weren't stopped. They weren't checked on. They weren't exposed with all their uh, gospel material that they had with them. So I want you to know we serve the true and a living God. All right. He's not just the God of the Old Testament. It's not just a book full of, you know, stories that are miraculous, but we don't see them today. I'm here to tell you our God can do the same. He can hide you. He can blind eyes. He can bring you through safely. And he did that. Now, we're going to start this week with uh, Jeremiah 38. <coughs> And like I told you before, Jeremiah, the chapters are not in sequence. Last week, we talked about Jehoiakim. He was the second son of Josiah, the good king, the father. Uh, but he himself was a bad king. He served uh, 11 years. And um, the next one would, was going to be his son. He was only served like um, three months, I believe. And then he was taken into captivity. And then the Babylonians put uh, Zedekiah in, uh, who was the third son of Josiah. And uh, he also served 11 years. All right. So starting here with uh, chapter 38, we're in the time of Zedekiah. All right. So I'm going to ask Rita to read the first three verses. Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 1 to 3. Then Shephatah, the son of Matan, and Gedaliah, the son of Pasha, and Jucha, the son of Shalemiah, and Pasha, the son of Mekah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, He that remaineth in the city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Verse 3, Thus saith the Lord, This city shall be surely this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, I mean, which shall take it. All right. Now, uh, th this is telling us, you know, like I just said, that Jeremiah is preaching in the days of Zedekiah. All right. This Shephatiah, Gedaliah, Jukul, and Pasher, these men were princes of Judah men that were connected to the royal family in some way, all right? And the aristocrats had their own status and interest to protect as this catastrophe of the complete Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem drew near, all right? They heard what Jeremiah had been preaching. Now, this this is many years, all right? He started uh, in the day of Josiah, if you remember, the father of these boys, or these three kings. And um, all the days of Josiah, he was telling them and warning them. But now Josiah was a good king. When he heard uh, what J Jeremiah had to say, he had a real reform done and uh you know ordered that all the other gods be destroyed and that they turn to god with all their heart so during the days of josiah nothing took place but then we we see the first son all right he jehoahaz i think his name was 
uh, he ended up going into um, Egypt, if I'm not mistaken. And there, you know, was there till the day that he died, actually. Um, so when they now, and then there's the 11 years of the second king, and that this is near the time of the end of Zedekiah. Uh, so he's been preaching for many, many years, and his message has never changed. You know, sometimes in daily life and secular life, uh, the doctors say this, or they say that, and then after a while, oh no, we have new studies and we find out that isn't so. It's now like this, and you know, the, the things change, but God's message never changes. It doesn't matter in what year, how many years ahead or behind, God's word never changes. It stays the same. And what we read today is been from ever, you know, from the very beginning. God never changes his message. And so this message was that they're going away that is bad and rebellious and self-centered uh, and self-willed and serving other gods. And therefore, God is predicting judgment. He's been doing that for years in the time of Jeremiah. And it has given the people plenty of time to repent and get things right. All right. So here, what he's telling them is if you don't give yourself over and, and surrender to the Babylonians, they're going to, and you want to stay in this Jerusalem, then you're going to die. You'll die in three different ways. All right. Um, Jeremiah was telling them, the people, that they need to surrender to the Babylonians so that they would live in exile and wait for the promised restoration of God's people. All right. Um, and he, he reiterated it one more time. The city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army. All right. He's talking about Jerusalem, which was the capital. And we know that um, Babylon came two times. All right. Um, the first time was when Daniel was taken captive. That was the best of the country, all right, they were taken captive and amalgamated into the Babylonian culture and so forth. And the second time was when Ezekiel was taken captive, all right, that, that grew. So there's a third time it's going to be, and that's when, in other words, they, they, they've seen that Jeremiah's preaching is so, all right, and yet they were stubbornly refusing and uh, saying they're, they're going to fight it through to the end, all right. Read verses four to six, would you? Yes. Jeremiah 38, verses four to six. Therefore the princess said unto the king, we beseech thee, let this man be put to death. For past he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of his people, but the hurt. Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not that he can do anything against you. Then took away Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Micaiah, the son of Hamlet, that was in the court of the prison. And they let down Jeremiah with cords. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sang in the mire. Yeah, so th this, in the very first verse that we read, if you remember, it said that they asked, King Zedekiah to execute Jeremiah 
because his message was bad for the morale of those defending Jerusalem. Well, it, it was bad for their morale. In other words, they were determined to do their own thing. They were determined to defend Jerusalem when God said there, it's no use because I am going to give it into their hands. And if you want to stay here, oh, I, I don't know. Just, I'm sorry. Jesus. No, no, no. I cannot. I'm teaching. Yeah. You come back in two hours. Well, you can take it off of what I'm, I, I need to tell you all what happened. There's somebody upstairs, they're always dropping their laundry, you know, and it, it'll fall down and land on my, I don't have poles, but I have, you know, where the poles should go. And then they want to come in, they want to open the window and they want to try to get their stuff. So I just said, no, you cannot come this time. You come back in two hours and you can look for your things. Anyways, that was what that was all about. I'm so sorry. Okay. Anyways, he, he was saying, uh, apparently Judah had locked, it, it says the men of war who remain, all right. He weakens the hands of the men of war who remain. So apparently, Judah had lost a few good men. No doubt some had fallen in battle, all right, while defending the city walls. Others were slipping out and by night, by ones and twos, and going to surrender uh, to the Babylonians. So that they're, they're the men of war who remain. And he said, this kind of a message is going to defeat their morale. Well, if they would obey it and listen, you don't need that morale. You just do what God says. And I'm here to tell you, friends, it doesn't matter what God says. He will bring it to pass. And if God says this is going to happen, it's going to happen. And we do better just to listen to God instead of figuring we can get around it somehow we can do our own thing and be, you know, victorious and come out on the good side. No, you cannot do the very opposite of what God tells you and expect to come out in, in a state of blessing. When we do what God says, like here, he's telling them, surrender to the Babylonians. That sounded to the natural man as treachery but god wanted it for good and those that went over were the best of the land and they were you know there yes they were there for a long time they were told later it was going to be for 70 years that's a long time but if you remember right uh god told him to buy uh, his cousin or uncle, one, a relative of his, to buy the land, all right, and uh, and keep that. Uh, he had the right of redemption for that land, and even though it was going to be seventy years before he would be able to redeem it, he probably wouldn't even be alive. It would have to be uh, some of his close of kin but he believed God enough to do it instead of saying whoa I'm not investing my money in something that I can't even think of ever redeeming it for 70 years no what God says is true and he did that in order to show 
his relatives and also show all those that were sitting round about when the transaction took place that he believed what God said himself and he was willing to, you know, back it up in action. All right. Um, these princes now, they, they said to Zedekiah, the king, he said, they're bad for the morale of the people and they're not seeking the welfare of the people, but seeking their harm. But this is actually the exact opposite of the truth. Uh, he didn't like preaching his message of doom. And, uh, but in doing it, he knew that he was giving the people of Judah their only chance of survival against the Babylonian threat. Because if they did their own thing and remained there, uh, it was going to be bad for them. All right. So sometimes God's servants are accused of exactly the opposite of the truth. Moses was um, a remarkably humble man in Numbers 12, 3. All right. Would you like to read that for us? Yes. Numbers 12, verse 3. Um. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Yeah, but he was accused of pride in Numbers 16.3. Would you read that for us? Numbers 16 verse 3. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, you take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. So in other words, why are you making yourself higher than the rest and, you know, and accusing him of pride, the very opposite of what God said he was. Job was a righteous man, but he was accused of great sin by his friends. We're not going to go back and read that, but um, he was accused of terrible sin, and yet he was righteous, all right? Uh, God himself said to the devil, have you seen a man like my servant Job, who is so this, that, and the other, and lifted him to high heaven? Uh, of how good he was and so forth, that God's testimony of people is the opposite of what the devil wants people to say they are, all right? Jesus was the spotless son of God, but he was accused of being demon-possessed, all right? So I tell you, if Jesus was accused in the way that he was, don't think that any of us are going to be less likely. Don't, don't feel bad if people say the very opposite of you. This is why you and I need to know who we are in Christ. All right. And it doesn't matter what people say we are. If we are living for God, if we're doing what he wants, we need to know we are seated with Christ in heavenly place, places far above all principality, power, might, dominion. The devil would like to accuse us and condemn us in our hearts, but you and I need to cast down those thoughts, but make sure that in our daily walk, yes, we are obedient. And every day, check your life and heart. And if you see that you've done something wrong during that day, or maybe more than one thing, confess it, get it right, get under the blood, and stay in your spiritual position, which is seated together with Christ in heavenly places, all right? Um, what did Zedekiah answer, all right? He says, look, he is in your hand. 
In other words, he's saying, do whatever you want. They wanted the king to execute him, all right? Because they didn't want the blood of Jeremiah on their hands. So they were saying, you execute him. But he said he didn't have the courage to stand up to the princes of Judah. Rather, he allowed them to do to Jeremiah as they please. So they took him and lowered him into a dungeon-like pit where Jeremiah sank in the mire. Mire is like mud, all right? Just, um, almost like quicksand. You just go down, 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 and uh, you can't get out of it. Uh, it's terrible, all right? Zedekiah, all right, I told you, was a very, he had no backbone. Uh, he believed in God with his head, but didn't dare to stand up for what God says. He, he could remember during the time of his uh, father's time. And, you know, and he saw what took place then, but he didn't have the nerve to take the place and just declare, I want to follow God. I want to do what God says, because, you know, the, all these others um, are wanting to fight for the country and fight for the land. He was actually a puppet, um, puppet king. He was put there and he made a pledge that he would obey the, the uh, Babylonians and so forth, but he didn't. All right. He seems to have been an alumnus uh, in the same school of politics. This is what a man called Riken wrote. Uh, Zedekiah seems to be the same school of politics that Pontius Pilate was. Pontius Pilate wanted to set Jesus free, but he also wanted to please the religious leaders of that day. And in the end, he chose to please them instead of what his heart told him. He, he said, even to the very end, he has done nothing to deserve this. All right, then why don't you? And his own wife came and told him, don't do it. I've been troubled at nighttime in dreams because of this. This is a righteous man, but he, he couldn't find it to set him free. And the same thing here with Zedekiah. All right. Uh, it says they let Jeremiah down with ropes. The intention of the princes was clearly to kill him. Please let this man be put to death. That's what they told the king. Yet in uh, the most hypocritical way, they did not want to bear the guilt of shedding of his blood. So instead of pushing him into the dungeon and allowing him to fall, which probably would have uh, opened a wound and caused his blood to be shed, they carefully lowered him down into that um, pit with ropes, all right, into that dungeon where he would die a slow death from famine, exposure, or disease, but technically without blood being shed where they would feel guilty about that. So, you know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all else. Who can know it? All right. Only God knows and sees and, and warns ahead. Now, um, in this dungeon, which was at the house of Malchiah, there was no water, but only mud like mire. Uh, all right. It was a cistern. And the final intention of these officials was to bring about Jeremiah's death without bloodshed, all right? He could well die a slow and painful and bloodless death in that cistern or in that dungeon. It was like a pit, 
a pit, but it said a cistern. All right. Uh, there, there was nothing to keep him alive. They didn't put food down there for him. He was just left to, you know, starvation is a slow death. Because as long as your body doesn't die, your body will feed on itself till finally it's so weak it gives up and actually dies. All right. Uh, read verse 7 to 13. But, you know, God is a good God. And sometimes when those who claim to know him don't do anything god can look to other people he can look to strangers all right and in this portion of scripture go ahead and read for us will you jeremiah 38 verses 7 to 13 now then about malak the ethiopian one of the eunuchs which was in the king's house heard that they had put jeremiah in the dungeon the king then sitting in the seat in the gate of Benjamin, Ibak Malak went out, went, went forth, went, went forth out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying, "My lord, the king, this man has done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they have cast into the dungeons, and he is like to die for hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city." Verse 10, then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence thirty men with thee, and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he die. So Ebed Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury, and took thence old cast clocks and old rotten wrecks, and let down by cords into the dungeon. To Jeremiah and Ibak Malak the Ethiopian said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clocks and rotten wrecks under thy armholes under the courts. And Jeremiah did so. Verse 13 And they drew up Jeremiah with courts and took him up out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Okay, this Ibak Malak, all right, the Ethiopian one of the eunuchs you know god chose this um this foreigner he wasn't allowed in the temple he couldn't go in and offer sacrifices like the others but he did believe in god and you know he was more godlike in his heart than these other people just because we have the name christian just because we go to church just because we were born in a christian home doesn't mean that we have a heart like god all right but he went to uh king and he he pled on his behalf and he said you know he's in that dungeon he'll probably die all right and so you know, please help him. There's no water, there's no food, there's nothing there. And um, he, he appeals to the king on the prophet's behalf. Being a foreigner, all right, like I already told you, he was excluded from the simple, the temple and uh, many of the Jewish rituals, yet he had a more godly and compassionate heart than most of the ruling class and uh, who did participate in those rituals, all right? Ibn Malik's simple means, simply means that name, Ibn Malik, means servant of the king. It was not much of a name even though it was the man's proper name, it shows he had no identity of his own. All right. Um, lift him out of the dungeon before he dies. 
Now, Zedekiah, like I mentioned, he's a wishy-washy guy. He believes in God, but not enough to stand up against anybody else's uh, word, all right? And like he said, who am I to do anything against you? What do you mean? You're the king. They're princes. And you, as the king, your word goes ahead of theirs. All you had to do was say, no, I am not having him killed. He's a prophet of God. So you don't like to hear what he has to say. I am not killing him. He could have said that, but he didn't. All right. And so um, he, he was influenced by others so easily. And when the princess wanted to kill him, he said, he's in your hands. Do whatever you want. When Ebed Melek comes and to his fa face tells him, what was happened to what happened to him and what the princess had done to him. You know, he said, Oh, Oh, quickly take him out, take him out. It, it's the very like opposite, do whatever you want. And then uh, when he hears what they did, he's willing to get him out. But of course we know that was God that was preserving Jeremiah's life also. Uh, okay. And um, he was near death and he tells him to let 30 men help him. You might wonder why so many, all right? But, and Ibn Malik was very careful. He didn't just throw down ropes and say, put this under your arm. As they're pulling him out of the mire, that means that he's stuck in this mud. He's probably up to his chest. And to pull like that, it would have pulled his arms right off his body. So he was a very compassionate man. He not only uh, was used of God to save Jeremiah's life, but to do it in a way that was most kind and compassionate. All right. And so got all of these um, old rags and like that and said, put those under your arm and then put the ropes on top of that. And then all the men with all of their strength, pulling, pulling slowly, slowly, uh, they were able to get him out. What, what a terrible thing. And, and to be there in that situation. And, you know, it really took the faith of God to believe that somehow God was going to get him out. After all, Jeremiah is a human being. And, you know, there you are day after day, no water, no food, nothing. And, and the, the smell, the, oh, it, it just must have been terrible. All right. Uh, But I really thank God for this Ebed Melek, you know. He was really a brave man to actually go against the princes. That they're, like I said, they were the ruling class. And uh, under the king, that they could do a lot of things. And they could have gotten Ebed Melek, uh, you know, so... But God, he was brave and he did what he felt God wanted him to do. All right. Um, now, another thing I want us to notice is that God is not only, you know, getting Ebed Melek to do this. He sees that he has that bravery, that faith, you know. To, to go against those princes and to try to rescue him. And so uh, we're not going to read it now, but because we're going to uh, actually do chapter 39 next. But in Jeremiah 39, 15 to 18, we find that 
God make sure that Ebed Melech is uh, rewarded properly and has Jeremiah prophesy to him uh, that God is going to take care of him, watch over him, and keep him alive. All right. And so Jeremiah uh, is brought out and stays in the court of the prison. He's rescued from that dungeon pit. All right. Uh, 14 to 16. Would you read that, please? Jeremiah 38, verses 14 to 16. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask thee a thing, hide nothing from me. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare unto you, will thou not surely put me to death? And it and if I give thee counsel, will thou not hearken unto me? So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth, that made us this so, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. So we see here that King Zedekiah wanted a private meeting with Jeremiah. All right. There are several similarities between the events of Jeremiah 37 and Jeremiah 38. Do you remember in 37, he begged the king who had asked him things in private. And he's, he had said to him, you know, don't, don't let me go back there and don't put me uh, down there again. He, he was um imprisoned and in in a dungeon all right but there are um these two chapters though some people try to say it's telling the same thing they're not 37 38 are more different than alike there are different charges made against jeremiah different place of incarceration different manner of rescue, different places of meeting with the king, and different conversations with the king, all right? Uh, it's more likely that they are indeed separate, those similar events. Jeremiah was true to his character, and Zedekiah was true to his character. So the same drama might have been acted out in similar but yet different ways. When he says, now you come and tell me and don't lie to me, you know, um, I, I promise you I won't put you to death because Jeremiah said, you want the truth, but are you gonna turn around and kill me if I tell you the truth? No, he promised him, uh, I, I won't, all right? I will not put you to death. Zedekiah swore that to Jeremiah and the name of the Lord in the name of the Lord all right that he would not kill the prophet nor allow others to do so so what was the final word to Zedekiah a final offer of mercy that's 17 and 18 Numbers 38, verses 17 and 18. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princess, then thy soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and thou shalt live in thine house. And if thou wilt not go, forth to the king of Babylon's princess. Then shall the city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand. Yeah. Now, uh, it says, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. All right. He was the Lord. That was Yahweh. All right. The covenant God. This is 
what Jeremiah claims as he gives these titles of the Lord. I'm not saying this out of my own mouth. I am telling you what the Lord Yahweh, the covenant God, has said. He was the God of hosts, the God of heavenly armies and all of their power. All right. When he said the God of the hosts, that's the myriads of spiritual heavenly armies. He was the God of Israel, the master and Lord of the covenant descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So by him saying that, he wasn't just rattling off names. He was showing the authenticity of what he is saying. It's not my words. These are his words. All right. And I tell you, he, he told it. It's. Uh, he told it just the way that it was, all right? Jerusalem's suicidal stand, all right? Uh, God is saying uh, he is going to surrender that city into the hands of the enemy, all right? This was God's remarkable patience and mercy to a king who rejected God's word many, many times before. Zedekiah could not prevent the conquest of Jerusalem by his repentance, but he could make that conquest much less severe, even now at this late of an hour. And you, you will see by these scriptures God is putting the whole responsibility on King Zedekiah's shoulders for the choice that is made, all right? Uh, definitely, they were going to be conquered, but he could have kept the Jerusalem from being burned if he would have really repented and done what God told him. He could have saved his sons from being killed had he done what God told him to do. He could have, because he was captured and he was taken into Babylon and his eyes were put out. Now, he, he didn't have, that didn't have to happen if he would have just listened to what God said. God was giving him a last minute chance to make still not to divert the whole thing, but it wouldn't have to be as bad as it ended up being. All right. So um, if he surrendered, his soul shall live. All right. If he surrendered, this city will not be burned with fire. If he surrendered, your house shall live his wives, children, royal family, and so forth, they would be spared from death. Surrender to the king of Babylon's princes. Zedekiah knew it was to surrender to princes. He shamefully surrendered to the princes of Judah, but here he was not willing to surrender to the princes of uh, Babylon. God warns Zedekiah to surrender to um, the right princes, all right, which is the Babylonian princes. The city shall not be burned with fire, all right. The fate of the city rested on one man's repentance and trust in the Lord. Surrender to the Babylonians would spare the city of Jerusalem. They would be conquered, but not destroyed and not burnt with fire. 19 to 23. Would, would you read for us verses 19 to 23? Sorry, I was muted. <clears throat> Numbers 38. Verses 19 to 23. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews that are fallen to the Chaldeans, 
lest they deliver me into their hand, and they mock me. And Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver thee. Obey, I, be I beseech thee, the voice of the Lord, which I speak unto thee. So it shall be well unto thee, and thy soul shall live. But if thou refuse to go forth, this is the word that the Lord hath showed me. And behold, all the women that are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princess. And this woman shall say, Thy friends have set thee on and have prevailed against thee. Thy feet are sunk in the mire and they are turned away back. 23. So shall they bring out all their wives and their children to the Chaldeans, and thou shalt not escape out of their hand, but shall be taken by the hand of the king of Babylon, and thou shalt cause the city to be burned with fire. Yeah. So he said, I'm a friend. For you who have your notes there, we're on page 18, all right? Um, number seven, all right? I think what was said is very clear. Jeremiah begged him, do what God says, do what God says, because if you'll just do what he says, God will lessen things, all right? But he just could not um, do it. He, he just couldn't do it and re refused to do it, all right? And let, let's do that last portion, all right? Um, that's 24 to 28. Jeremiah 38 verses 24 to 28. Then said Zedekiah unto Jeremiah, Let no man know of these words, and thou shalt not die. But if the princes hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto, me, unto thee and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death. Also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king, that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah and asked him, and he told them according to all these words that the king had commanded. So they let of speaking with him, for the matter was not perceived. Verse 28, So Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. It, it was Zedekiah the king who told him what to tell the princes. Tell part of the truth, but not all of it, all right? Just tell the part that won't get you into trouble, all right? What you said to me and what I did for you. And, um, but you know what? It, it didn't matter. What happened was Jeremiah stayed there in the court of the prison. That means of the king's house, all right? Uh, and there he remained until the city was taken because God said it was gonna be taken and it was taken, all right. Jeremiah remained there and, and, until Jerusalem was taken, and Jeremiah was not again taken to the pit dungeon, but remained in the court of the prison until Jerusalem was conquered, just as he had prophesied. Okay, let's take our um, break now. Uh, we'll come back at um, I think we're I, I need a little time here so we'll come back at 10 15 15 15 yeah, yeah. okay okay I know it's not <clears throat> 15 yet but it's okay let, let's start, we're going to start with Jeremiah 39, uh, the first three verses. Jeremiah 39, verses 1 to 3. 
in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And in the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, the ninth day of the month, the city was broken up. And all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Even Nega, Sereza, Sereza, uh, Sham, Shamga, Nebo, Sasekim, Repsaris, Nega, Sereza, Repmat, with all the residue of the princes of the king of Babylon. Okay. <coughs> So um, Nebuchadnezzar used, all right, the common method of attack in those days of securing walled cities, and it was called a siege, all right. A besieged city was surrounded, preventing all business and trade from entering or leaving the city eventually starving the population into surrender or the defense of the city gave way and the surrounding army poured into the weakened city. Um, after we finish Jeremiah, then the next book that we're going to go to is Lamentation. So I'm not going to read anything out of Lamentation now, but the book of Lamentation vividly describes some of the agony of Jerusalem under that siege, all right? The city was penetrated. It happened just as God said through his prophet Jeremiah. The Egyptians did not rescue Judah, and the Lord did not miraculously deliver, deliver them as he did with the Assyrians some 130 years before. That's of course referring to the Northern Kingdom when the 10 tribes were taken <coughs> captive. And if you remember, you know, God, God was so good. And, and in Jonah's day, uh, because they did repent, he delivered them. And then later another king came. So the kings, uh, who lead these countries, whether they're Jerusalem or whether the others, they, they have a lot of um, power and influence. If they want to do things God's way, they will get everybody to follow them. Not everybody, but the majority. If they don't want to do God's will, then, you know, the, the king and their influence is very strong. All right. Uh, so actually, the false prophets who promised deliverance and success were wrong. And Jeremiah now proved to be right. All right. The siege lasted for 18 months from the 10th of January all right, right to the 9th of July, uh, 10th of January, 588, to the 9th of July, 587. It was only interrupted that brief time when the Egyptians came and uh, the Babylonians quit the siege in order to go fight with the Egyptians, all right. Uh, once the Jerusalem fell, all right, all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. This showed their authority over the conquered city. It belonged to them now, and the names of the princes listed here uh, is difficult. It isn't easy to tell which is a name and which is a title in that list. All right, so we're not gonna try if oh, some of these commentators say that it's difficult to tell 
who am I to try to tell you what it is? So we just, all those names that our sister, uh, you know, read out, some of them are titles and some of them are the actual names of the people, all right? Um, verses four to five. Jeremiah 39, verses four to five. And it came to pass that when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, saw them and all the men of war, then they fled and went forth out of the city by night, by the way of the king's garden, by the, by the gate betwixt the two walls. And he went out the way of the plain, but the Chaldeans' army pursued after them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had taken him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Ribla in the land of Hamath where he gave judgment upon them, upon him. Yes. So we see here that Zedekiah, he didn't dare to let God save him and his city and his family. And now he deserts the people that he has doomed. Remember, I said his decision alone is what determined um, you know, what was going to happen to him. He could have kept the city from being burned if he would have just listened to God. He could have kept his sons alive if he would have just obeyed God. Those things didn't have to happen, but they did. And in the end, when he realized that they had come in and they were sitting there in that gate as the conquerors of the city, uh, he, he ran, he ran with those around him. He didn't try to save his family. He, he, he just left them behind. He deserted them because Zedekiah pretty much was somebody that was very self-centered. Everything he did, he had himself in mind. All right. He didn't know what it was to deny himself for his family. All right. Um, the King's Garden, all right, was located near the Pool of Siloam. You know, uh, this is one of the commentators which says this. He, he went by way of the uh, King's Garden. How he escaped, I, I don't know. But he evidently had a secret passage that he could go out. And at nighttime, he took this secret passage. Maybe it was underground when, you know, and then came up out there. Uh, so he didn't have to go through the gates or anything like that. All right. The, but the Chaldean army or the Babylonian army pursued them. All right. And they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. This was a good distance away from Jerusalem. They were not far from the Jordan River. And perhaps safety when they were captured. They, they were quite close to actually having made it and to be able to escape to safety. But the no, God said he was going to be given over. God said he was going to see the king of Babylon face to face, eye to eye. Everything God says comes to pass. Um, I read a story yesterday um, about an African preacher. His name is Benson Idahosa, I think. It might be different than that. I'm not sure if I remember the name. But when he was a young man, he, he was saved, you know, and God began to work in his heart and began to stir in his heart um, what God was wanting to do in and through him. And, um, and then one night he was actually sleeping and he had this 
either a dream or a vision at where, you know, he was in London and uh, then how, you know, he was led to this hotel. It was a gorgeous hotel, expensive hotel. And in the dream, he said to the Lord, you know, Lord, I don't have this kind of money to come to a place like this. And God assured him, said, you don't worry, I'm going to take care of everything for you. And it, it showed the inside of the hotel, the wealth of it, the riches of it, and showed him being led by, you know, a European man that was like doing the serving, uh, bringing him into this dining room of this hotel and serving him food. And it was like, whoa, it was like mind boggling. Well, he said, you know, God began to use him around the world and finally took him for, to many, many different countries. But this thing about London never happened. Uh, he, he just left that with God, all right? And soon he became uh, quite world renowned. And then he wrote a book and one day he got an invitation from uh, a church in London. We've read your book and we've heard of, you know, the things God has done through your life and everything. And would you be willing to come and preach for us? He didn't lose any time. He just wrote and said, yes, all right. But when he got over there um, and was taken to this hotel, at first he didn't remember his dream. It was just like each step he took, each place he went, it's like, I've been here before, I've been here before, you know? And then finally inside of that hotel, he began to recognize things in it and he thought, oh, this is that dream that I had. It was, you know, 20 years or more before that he had had that dream. But it was right to a T exactly what, what it was. And, you know, this is the same thing with Jeremiah. You remember uh, way back when we first started it, we did it. We talked about the. The, fi the good figs and the bad figs, all right? The good figs were the two um, first, when, uh, what, what do you call it? Ba Babylon came in the first two times, where I said the first time Daniel was taken captive, and then the second time was Ezekiel was taken captive. And these were considered the good figs. They would be taken there and they would stay there that whole time. And then God was going to bring them back again and give them their own country back after that long stay in Babylon. To a T, exactly everything was said. You see, our God is a God who knows everything. The end, he knows the end from the beginning, all right, before things happen. He knows. He can give dreams. He can give visions. He, he can, in minute detail, tell you what's going to take place. And later, it will take place just like that. And so, this is the same way, all right? Um, Zedekiah was the bad figs. It was the bad figs, all right? And it wasn't the blessing of God on them. It was that they were going to die. They were going to be, you know. Now, he ended up going into Babylon. And he died in Babylon. But it was all very terrible things that happened to him. All right. So uh, they were captured as they uh, were trying to get away. All right. And the Chaldeans captured Zedekiah, but even more so, God captured him. In, in other words, 
uh, God had already shown you're going to be given into his hands and um, you're, you're going to see him face to face. But it, it was quite a bitter story that was told. And sure enough, just according to prophecy, the fulfilled prophecy, all right, um, Ezekiel 12, 13, can you turn to that? Because, you know, when we read Lamentation and when we read Ezekiel, it's all about the same period, all right? But from different uh, eyes and different people's lives, all right? So read the prophecy of Ezekiel 12, 13. Ezekiel 12, 13. My net also will I spread upon him, and he shall be taken in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. All right. Now, see, it says, yet he shall not see it. Even though he goes there, he will not see it, but he's going to die there. This is a prophecy given by Ezekiel, but it doesn't name Zedekiah's name, but that's exactly what happened to Zedekiah, all right? They brought him to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and several times before, Jeremiah had prophesied that Zedekiah would meet the king, all right, that he rebelled against face to face, and now it was fulfilled. Ripla uh, is an ancient Syrian town to the south of Kadesh on the river Orontes. It was situated at a strategic point where military highways between Egypt and Mesopotamia met. All right, six to 10, would you read it for us? Jeremiah 39, verses 6 to 10. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Ripla before his eyes. Also, the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of Judah. Moreover, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with chains to carry him to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the houses of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. Their neighbor Zaradan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive into Babylon the remnant of the people that remained in the city, and those that fell and those that fell away, that fell to him with the rest of the people that remained. But neighbor Zaradan, the captain of the guard, left of the door of the left of the poor of the people, which had nothing in the land of Judah and give them vineyards and fields at the same time. All right, so uh, what does it say? It says the king of Babylon, when Zedekiah was brought to him, killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, made sure he saw as his sons were being killed. And uh, I don't know how he felt. But he had been told if only he would listen to God, God would preserve his family. God would, you know, and to see that and know it was because he chose to please himself, chose to save himself, chose to do what he felt was the wisest thing to do, uh, that this was actually happening. All right. He refused to obey God and surrender to the Babylonians so his wives and children would suffer, all right? Here that terrible promise was being fulfilled. The king of the Babylonians also killed the no all the nobles of Judah. And, you know, not only the nobles, the, the princes of Judah who rebelled against God and hated his prophet Jeremiah, they were justly judged, they got their due. They said, get rid of Jeremiah, and instead, they're the ones that had to die. The Bible talks about, you know, being falling into the pit that you made yourself. So uh, when we don't do things God's way, 
when we try to get rid of God's people, in the end, it will happen to us, all right? Um, after all of this, all right, then they put Zedekiah's eyes out and they bound him with bronze fetters, all right, to carry him to Babylon. He was put in chains. Brass also speaks of um, judgment, all right? Uh, the Babylonians were not known to be as cruel as the Assyrians who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel some 130 years earlier, but they were still experts in cruelty in their own right. They made certain that the last sight King Zedekiah saw was the murder of his own sons and then spent the rest of his life in darkness, all right? This fulfilled that mysterious promise that uh, God had made through Ezekiel regarding Zedekiah uh, concerning the fall of Jerusalem. I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, yet he shall not see it, though he shall die there. We read that just, a, uh, you know, um, some just today. We read that very thing written by Ezekiel. And this was talking about Zedekiah because before he was taken in the chains, he saw his sons being murdered. That was the last thing he saw. And then um, his eyes were put out, all right? Assyrian sculptures show how kings delighted to put out, often with their own hands, the eyes of the captive rulers. Those that they conquered, they that was one of their forms of, you know, to put their eyes out. In other words, you won't see anymore, you won't be able to make decisions anymore, you're, you're finished, all right? And, um, he was to die blinded and in exile. It was, protect, it was predicted in peace and with mourning rights proper uh, to the king. Because when he died, he was given a good burial. But what good is it, all right? Had he listened to the Lord, he would have gone into captivity, which he did anyways. All right. He, he, he was taken into captivity, but he lost his family. He lost his eyesight. He lost many things, all right, uh, that he wouldn't have had he gone in in obedience to the Lord. Friends, we just need to speak to ourselves. I'm not going to talk to you. You don't talk to me. We need to tell ourselves, it doesn't matter what happens. Obey the Lord. Listen to the Lord. Allow him to warn us of things and put it into practice. And God will fulfill all that he says. All right. Um, it tells us how these Chaldeans burn the king's house and the houses of the people with fire. They broke down the walls of Jerusalem. All right. Jerusalem was burned and destroyed, just as God promised Zedekiah. Uh, the king hardened his uh, heart through disobedience. All right. Um, now, let's go on to this Nebuzaradan. Nebuchadnezzar was the king, all right, uh, of Babylon after his father had died. But this Nebuzaradan is the captain of the guard. He carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of all the people who remained. 
all but the poorest of the land were taken as forced refugees and exiles to Babylon, all right? Uh, in all fulfilled, all of this fulfilled the word of the Lord and vindicated the Lord's prophet, Jeremiah. It happened just as God said. God said disaster would come from the north. It came. Uh, God said a strange foreign nation would attack. That happened. God said Jerusalem would be surrounded and besieged. It happened. God said there would be famine in the land. It happened. I could read you all those. But we've already done them. All right. You go back and just see uh, everything he said. God said the whole land would be laid waste. That happened. God said nations and kingdoms would be torn down. That happened. All right. Uh, God said death would enter the city. That happened. God said enemy kings would sit in the gates of Jerusalem. That happened. All right. God said the city would be burned. That happened. God said the people would be taken into exile. That happened happened all right now let's read verses 11 to 14 all right the lord cares for his servants all right those that die are because they didn't obey the lord but those that were god's servants god takes care of them so please read this 11 to 14 Jeremiah 39, verses 11 to 14. Now Nebuchadrezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look well to him, and do him no harm, but do unto him even as he say unto thee. So Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, sent Nebuchadnezzar, Repsaris, and Nigar, Negar, Shereza, Rebmech, and all the king of Babylon's princes. Even they sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the prison and committed him unto Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shephan, that he should carry him home. So he dwelt among the people. Yeah. So, you, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we can see here that Jeremiah is being protected by the Babylonians. Now, could be just that God laid it on uh, Nebuchadnezzar's heart, but I'm prone to think, you know, he was very um, overtly speaking forth this message. And don't tell me that some of these that... Um, were taken captive, they they told that, and it was shown that the different ones that fell out to the Babylonians, uh, that, you know, he was preaching this message. He was teaching and preaching and begging people to give themselves over. So uh, God made sure that um, Nebuchadnezzar knew all this. And so he tells that uh, captain of the guard, he said, um, you, you want to take him and look after him. Don't do any harm to him and do to him just as he says to you. So in other words, you listen to him. He's somebody that knows what's going on. And um, Jeremiah had to wonder what would become of him when the Babylonians eventually conquered Jerusalem. But God cared for his first faithful servant, keeping him safe and in favor with Nebuchadnezzar and his captains. All right. Um, now, now an old man, Jeremiah was released from the prison, protected by the Babylonians, allowed to live among the people once again. This was a demonstration of God's grace. 
even in the larger content of the judgment. 15 to 18, these are our last verses. Jeremiah 39, verses 15 to 18. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to abed melech the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good, and they shall accomplish in that day before thee. But I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the man of whom thou art afraid. Verse 18, For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. Yeah, so we can see that these words were given to Jeremiah before the city fell, all right? Uh, God told him, uh, I'm going to bring these words, but I, this is what I want you to tell Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian. I'm going to bring my words to pass on this city for bad and not for good, all right? But I have delivered you. So um, he's the one that rescued Jeremiah when the prophet was near death in the pit-like dungeon. And we talked about that in Jeremiah 38. I'm going to bring my words on this city for adversity and not for good. God assured Ebed Melech that the catastrophe upon Jerusalem was actually his will and it would be completed. But he said, though the destruction of Jerusalem was certain, so was the deliverance of the man who rescued the prophet of God and put his trust in God. It took a lot of courage for Ebed Melech to oppose the princes of Judah and to appeal to the king, all right? But that risk and courage was rewarded. God does, when we do things for God and when we take God's side, God never forgets it. He puts it down and he will make sure that we are rewarded for that, all right? Um, this shows that you don't have to be a famous prophet to receive God's grace in the midst of judgment. It was also extended to a Gentile man, excluded from the temple, who trusted God. This shows us that his compassionate acts were motivated by his trust in the Lord. Because you have put your trust in me, that's what God said, because you have put your trust in me, Ebed Melech could come and find refuge in the God of Israel through trust, through faith. We cannot notice, uh, we can notice that it says nothing of the heroism, the compassion, or the resourcefulness of his rescue operation. All right, but it was just that he had faith in God and because he had trust in God, God is the one that promises him, I will surely deliver you, all right? And, and that Hebrew delivering, deliver the it would be a great stay of mind if God should say the same thing to us in particular and by name as he did here to the Ethiopian, Ebed Melech. Yet he saith no less to us in the precious promise which we are by faith to appropriate. That's what um, a man called Trap wrote, all right? Friend, every promise of the work of the Lord is amen, yea, and amen to him that believeth. When we believe it, when we put our trust in him, 
when we obey him, when we do that which is pleasing in his sight, he will make sure that we come out on top. And though many of them were killed, many of them destroyed, and only the very poorest were left in the country. And that um, captain of the guard told them, you can go anywhere you want. You can take any of these vineyards and uh, just claim it as your own and you can raise your own food and so forth. He was good to them, all right? Um, but they didn't go into captivity, all right? Uh, they probably were those that had rebelled and tried to save Jerusalem when God said it's under judgment. I pray that you and I have learned a lot out of these two chapters. It doesn't pay to do our own thing. It doesn't pay to try to preserve our life, please ourselves, try to outsmart God and his word. It does pay to follow his word, to obey him, to please him. And we will find if we go to God's side, stand up for God and do what God's word tells us to do, the way he tells us to do it, he will take care of us. He will look after us. He will supply our every need. So praise the Lord. Shall we bow our head? All right. Um, Father, right now, we thank you for what we have read today and how your word never comes. It says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. He, you will fulfill your word. And blessed is the man who trusteth in him, who causes his life to be given over to God and depends on God and does things the way God tells him to do. Oh, God, may we be those that choose to be on your side, choose to do things your way. Choose to deny the self because in the end, your promises will be fulfilled in our life. And we can know that we have a hope and that we can depend on you and you will fulfill your word to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I bless you, Lord. I praise you, Lord, that you have redeemed us. You have taken us out of the miry clay. You have planted our feet on solid ground. We love you for it, Lord. And may we not turn our backs on you. May we not turn away from you, but may we keep our eyes on you ever being grateful and thankful to you that you have created us brand new creatures and you have given us a position in Christ. Not only have you put us in Christ, but we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion and every name that is named. Lord, we don't deserve it. We haven't done a thing to deserve it. But by believing you, trusting you, submitting to you, you have fulfilled what you wrote concerning us. May we always see our spiritual position that we are seated with you in heavenly places. Thank you, Jesus, in thy wonderful and precious name. Amen. Bye. Thank you.
Rita, and we will see you on Tuesday, Lord willing, back with the book of Numbers.